All right, this is for my seventh hour class on the 11th of April. Um, Cautiously optimistic that this class is going to get to where I want them to go. Anyway, um, so the 18th Amendment was passed. The 18th Amendment was passed, and um, booze became illegal in America. And uh, there were a lot of groups that that supported uh, prohibition. Uh, there's an American Prohibition Party right now. It never has enough supporters in Oklahoma to get on the ballots, but in some states, it does. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, no doubt about it, America had, had a drinking, had a drinking problem. America has a drug, drug problem today. Um, but, uh, prohibition was supported by churches, not all churches, but conservative churches. A lot of wives supported it because, you know, they didn't want the husband heading home from work at the end of the week. And he had the rent money and the grocery money for the next week. And he and his buddies would stop in the bar and drink it all up. Uh, businessmen supported it. Uh, they were against this thing, which was where we left off, called Blue Monday absenteeism. If you paid your employees on Friday, they uh, might spend the whole week drinking. And uh, on Monday morning, they had a hangover, so they'd just call in sick. And that led to the loss of a lot of uh, uh, production, you know, because half your workforce was home uh, nursing, nursing a hangover. Uh, religious leaders rightfully, rightfully pointed out the role that alcohol played in poverty and child abuse. You know, the dad gets drunk, comes home and beats uh, the children, uh, divorce, uh, destruction of the family, um, uh, unwanted pregnancies. Uh, the alcohol played a role in all those things. And prohibitionists, people who favored prohibition said, once prohibition passes, then uh, America won't have any more poverty. America will just become an oasis of sobriety uh, and everything would be better. Society's problems would simply go away. Well, uh, prohibition worked to an extent. Early in prohibition, because you could be arrested for drinking a can of beer, uh, drinking levels in the country fell at first by half, mostly in rural areas. Uh, it fell off, but, uh, you know, here's... Uh, there's, there's some prohibition agents dumping a barrel of beer. Uh, there's some uh, pouring uh, whiskey or gin or something out into the, to the sewer. Uh, there's a group of guys uh, doing, making a bust in a warehouse where they've got all this illegal booze to sell. Okay, um, and so uh, at first drinking felt, but. Even out in the rural areas, you know, there was still a demand for drinking, and uh, almost every little town had a bootlegger. You know what that is. You know, he wore these high boots and would slip half pint bottles down his boot. He would just be riding along, and he knew his customers, and he would sell you stuff right out of his shoe. Or moonshiners. Why do they call them moonshiners? These guys running a still. Yeah, so the that's exactly right. By the light of the moon, moonshiners. Uh, but the problem with prohibition is, I uh, sad to say, like the problem with, you know, we have a drug war that we've spent jillions of dollars on for the last 50 years, and it's made very little, if any, effect in this country. I'm sad to report that. But the problem with attempting to outlaw alcohol is that alcohol in the 1920s was America's chief recreational drug. In other words, Americans, you know, you can pass a law, but Americans still wanted to drink. Uh, Americans you know, uh, up until, you know, still to this day. Now, we have medicinal marijuana, and that's, I think, the last step before you legalize recreational marijuana. I think it won't be long until Oklahomans vote uh, on that. And as a voter, as a Republican and a conservative, I voted for medicinal marijuana, and uh, I will vote for recreational marijuana. And I won't vote for recreational marijuana because I want people to use marijuana, but uh, I ask students all the time, 
you know, what's more, what's, what would be more difficult for you to get? Is it more difficult for you to get cigarettes or is it more difficult for you to get marijuana? Well, the obvious answer is it's more difficult for you to get cigarettes because when you walk, now I'm not saying it's impossible. See what teachers say and what students hear, you know, by the time my words float six feet, you know, you, you it gets in your brain and just whoa, whoa, scrambles and you hear a completely different thing than I'm saying, but I'm not saying it's impossible to get cigarettes, but it's more difficult. And I want to make it. And why is that true? Because the government controls it. Because you walk into the 7-Eleven and say, yeah, give me a pack of uh, you know, Marlboro Lights. They look at you and say, get out of here, you idiot. Uh, the government controls it, by the way. Well, anyway, government controls it. I used to, I worked in a liquor store in college. It's one of the many jobs I had. And you'd always get these little snits coming in. Uh, you know, uh, about 12 years old, saying, yeah, give me a pint of Jack Daniel, you know? And I said, no, I'll just give you a swift kick right out the door. Uh, you could just tell by looking at it. And now that doesn't mean they couldn't go right down the street and say to somebody, oh, you know, go buy us a case of beer. And then, you know, some guys, uh, we'll give you a six pack if you'll buy us a case of beer. And they would do it. I'm not saying it makes it impossible for them to get, but I want to make it as difficult for you to get until your brain starts to mature a little bit. You know, this front part, which is judgment, it's not done yet. It's just as, as intelligent and as smart and as cool, whatever the word is that you, that you think you are, you're not. Uh, that part of your brain is not done. I want to let all you intellectuals in on that. That's your decision. And until that's, I want to put it off your ability to buy booze or marijuana or cigarettes or anything else like that, any, any sort of mood altering, mind altering, until you're the front part of your brain. And then you can make a more intelligent hopefully a more intelligent decision. So that's why I'm going to vote for it. You know, I never used mar I've never used marijuana in my life. I have no desire to use marijuana. I've been around where people were, when I was in school, of course, I've been around occasions where people were smoking uh, marijuana and, uh, you know, it's not, uh, I've never touched, smell like me burning one of those Scantron cards over there, you know, it didn't seem too attractive at all. Of course, I can't criticize the marijuana users because I use the most destructive uh, drug in history. It kills more Americans than you know, what? Alcohol. Yeah. And what have we done with alcohol? The most destructive drug in history. We've legalized it. The government controls it. They sell it and I don't know, pay my salary with it. Okay. So yeah, that's the most destructive drug in history. Uh, ironically, uh, you know, and, 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 and we've tried to uh, stamp out marijuana. But what's the problem with making marijuana illegal? Why doesn't that work? Why doesn't it work? What was the problem? I just told you, what was the problem with making booze illegal? People still want to drink. What's the problem with making uh, marijuana illegal? People still want to smoke marijuana. Not all people, but some people do. And by the way, marijuana was legal until 1937. 1937, it was legal. And Congress finally uh, outlawed it. Cocaine was legal until 1914. It absolutely was. Cocaine was legal until 1914. It was used in, why do you think Coca-Cola is called Coca-Cola? A, a doctor in Georgia named John Pemberton invented Coca-Cola. He put cocaine in it. People complain about Red Bulls. Huh? People can complain about what? People say Red Bulls are going to kill you. Yeah, <laughs> Red Bull. Well, you know, if you were walking down the street on a hot, dusty afternoon and you're just kind of feeling down, or, you know, you were just so angry, you just signed, a, you know, been in a, in a dispute over a contract in your law office and your blood vessels were about to explode in your head. You could just go in the drugstore and say, give me a Coca-Cola. And you could drink it with the cocaine and it would just calm you down. Everything in the world seemed great. And that was perfectly legal. Coca-Cola was advertised as, let me get the Coke one up here. Uh, it was advertised that, there we go, Coca-Cola. It was advertised as, uh, you know, drink this to soothe, to soothe, your nerves, okay? Um, dentists and doctors carried cocaine uh, in their uh, medical bags. Uh, if you went to the dentist, they didn't, you know, and I've never had a desire to use cocaine, but I hate needles and I hate getting shots. And when they stick that big needle in my mouth to do something to my teeth, it just, uh, just uh, um, I don't think I would object if they didn't tell me, we're just going to rub a little cocaine on there and the whole side of your head goes numb, okay? And they pull your tooth and you know, for a couple of hours, you don't know if you're the history teacher or the queen of Bavaria. Uh, and then you come back down and you're okay. Uh, FDR, you know, there they have, there was a radio show. And they said, which American president used cocaine? You know, uh, as a question, call in. And, uh, 
you know, nobody could get it. And I said, well, it was Franklin Roosevelt. And, you know, people just automatically in their 21st century minds started thinking, you know, FDR sitting there in his wheelchair, rolling up a dollar bill and <laughs> snorting cocaine, you know, and then saying, we bombed who? Uh, no, you know, uh, but what it was, was FDR had a severe uh, nasal uh, allergy problems. And he's the first, we'll get to him hopefully, and he's the first uh, uh, media master. He was the master of the radio. He had this wonderful speaking voice. Uh, the American people just loved it. Uh, but when his nasal passages were stuffed up, he sounded like you. I don't know if this you're too young. Daffy Duck, you ever heard of him? Da-da, da-da, da-da. That's how Roosevelt. And so if he had a major radio address, his doctor would simply come in, his doctor that carried cocaine, like all doctors or most doctors carried cocaine, and he would take a swab and put it down in that and just swab his nasal. And it was just open right up. And FDR could go make a radio speech and sound like FDR. But those goofy people on the radio thought he was snorting. Like I say, we declared war against who? You know, I was hiring. No, no, that's not what he did. He just used that on his nasal, nasal passages. Marijuana and cocaine were outlawed. By the way, the 1928 hit song, just think about this. 1928 hit song was Cocaine Habit. That's what the teenagers were dancing to. And it went like this. I love my whiskey. I love my gin. But the way I love my co- is a dad gone sin. That was one verse from that song, 19, 1928. See, when some of these old geezers shake their fingers at you, well, anyway, marijuana and cocaine were outlawed while the most destructive drug in history, alcohol, is legal today. For the record, 60,000 people a year die from drug abuse. The number, what is the number one killer? All right. What? No, no. All right. Well, it's, it's a big, uh, uh, what? Car accident. No, 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 no. Drugs. Oh. Drugs, okay. Sick, die from drug abuse. We'll get the alcohol in a minute. Minus alcohol. That's what I'm trying to say. Minus alcohol. So which, which drug? You know, I mean, you don't hear people. Oh. They don't, listen, we don't even consider alcohol a drug, and it's the most destructive drug in history. You go to these assemblies, the re- we're going to have a drug and alcohol, like they're two different things. No. Alcohol is the most destructive drug in history. So we're going to leave it aside for just a moment. Yeah, it kills a lot more. But but the other drugs that you hear about. Heroin. Heroin. Okay. Any other guesses? Heroin, by the way, kills 10,000 people a year. Cocaine kills 6,000 people a year. Uh, cigarettes. No. Well, tobacco. Uh, tobacco kills 500,000 per year. Meth. Meth. No, that's not it. That's Prescription yeah. drugs. Oh, 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 yeah, opioids, yeah, prescription drugs. Uh, kill 42,000. Uh, that, that's you know, divide that by 365. How many people are dying of opioid addictions uh, every day? So, so for the record, 60,000 minus alcohol, 60,000 people die a year from drug abuse. The number one killer is prescription drugs, 42,000 of that 60,000 are prescription drugs. Heroin is next 10,000, cocaine is next 6,000. And you point out correctly, tobacco, which is perfectly legal, we fund building, you know, they're probably building that road out there with funds from, the, some funds from tobacco. They kill half a million people a year. Alcohol kills 80,000 people a year. Think about that, think about that. Heroin kills 10,000 and alcohol, which we have legalized, kills, kills 80,000 people a year. Uh, in fact, the alcohol industry pays about $400 billion a year in taxes. So 60,000 die of, quote, drug abuse. You know what I'm saying? I'm talking about the, the drugs we eat. Six, and 600,000 a year die of alcohol and tobacco. So that makes sense that we've legalized those. And it kills over a half a million of us every year, and yet... Mar- co- marijuana, cocaine, those and marijuana doesn't kill, but, but those things uh, uh, kill only uh, kill sixty thousand a year. That's you know ten percent of what alcohol and tobacco kills. Well, anyway, so so you know it's it's the, the drug war has been a failure. I think almost everybody would admit that. I mean, here we are in this little slice of Americana call you follow. If I were so inclined, I could go out today. You know, here. I, Every, every direction I look, I see an American flag or a church steeple. But right here in this little slice of Americana, I left here today at 315. 
uh, and I wanted to get, I could get any drug probably in this county that they're selling on the streets of Chicago. Uh, the drug war, the drug war, yeah, the drug war has, has failed, okay, the drug war has failed. Well, anyway, uh, so the government said booze was illegal, but get this down, there were plenty of people, there were plenty of people ready to supply Americans with booze. In the big cities like Oklahoma City and Dallas and New York City and Chicago and Kansas City, uh, illegal bars started opening up. And what did they call you? know, you've all seen the movies. I want to go back to this and make sure my numbers are right. Okay, the number one, 64,000, wait a minute, over 64,000, Oklahoma, number one painkiller abuse, 952 die a year. It's better than one a day. Uh, 18 per week, heroin, 35,000 deaths per year. Well, I need to update my notes. Uh, cocaine, 6,000 per year. Alcohol, 88,000. Tobacco, 500,000. Uh, 100,000 die in automobile accidents. That's 2,000 per day. Gun deaths, 30,000 every year. That's 83 people a day. More Americans die of heroin and opioid abuse each year than were killed in the Vietnam War. Seven people per hour die of either heroin or op opioid abuse, okay? And the government has fought for 50 years to outlaw those and enforce their outlaw decrees, and they haven't been able to do it. Anyway, so, and because people want those drugs. Well, anyway, in the big cities, illegal saloons opened up. You've all seen the movies, right? Where a couple, somebody comes up, knocks the door, they slide, the, and uh, the guy inside will put his ear up to the door. So you can what? Say the, code. Say the password. Yeah, I got that down the path, but you got to whisper it. He's trying to make sure you're not the what? Cops. The police. So if you know the password, you can get into these illegal saloons. These illegal saloons, because you had to whisper the password to get in, were called speakeasies. All right, get that down, speakeasies. And just to show you how well prohibition was working, just to show you how well prohibition was working, one year, just think about this, one year, after prohibition went into effect, there were 10,000 speakeasies in the city of Chicago alone. That's one year. How well is prohibition working? One year after prohibition, and one year after the 18th Amendment went into effect, there were 30,000 speakeasies in the city of New York City alone. You know, the, there were all sorts of problems with the enforcement of prohibition. Number one, look at the United the map of the United States. We have huge we have huge borders. Okay, we have huge borders. Uh, plus, we are bounded on the north by Canada and on the south by Mexico. And while the United States became dry, Canada and Mexico remained wet. Alcohol was still legal there. And so smugglers, you know, smugglers like the drug smugglers today, the fentanyl people today, are making a killing off Americans. Um, but smugglers uh, smuggled in booze from Canada and Mexico uh, and did a landmark business. And it, they, got, they got very, very rich. And they came up with all sorts of unique ways to get around the law. There were charter boats in Boston. You could charter a boat, just move your, you know, if they shut your, your, your pub down in Boston, just rent a boat, put your bar and put your booze and throw gambling and a little prostitution in on the side. And you could sail out past the U.S. legal waters, and there's nothing the government could do. And then you could just run charter boats back and forth. And a lot of people, a lot of people did that. You could take the ferry out for a wild weekend. People made their own booze for seven bucks. You could go to any hardware store and you could buy everything you needed for seven bucks to uh, build a still. It's kind of like the meth uh, scourge that we have. You know, a lot of I used to buy pills to warm my dogs at the feed store, you can't do that anymore because apparently they uh, use that in producing meth. And so you've got to go to a vet, you've got to have a prescription, you've got to buy it right there from the vet. Well, same thing was true in the 20s and 30s. You could buy everything you needed at the local hardware store for seven bucks to make a still, and then you were in business. College boys made uh, gin. Uh, they called it bathtub gin. They made it in the bathtubs of their dorm rooms, okay? Uh, but you had to know your bootlegger. You know, when we, you know, when you went to a bootlegger, you had to know, you had to know who it was. You know, hardly a sports season goes by. Well, maybe that's a little extreme. Hardly a five or six years go by that you've got some promising athlete. He's doing, he's he's playing ball or she's playing. Well, seems to be boys more. 
but he's playing. We'll just we'll just use males. He, he's playing. You know, he's playing professional basketball or football or some great sport. You know, every boy's dream maybe. Uh, and you know, he goes up for a layup and drops down dead. And then they checked, and he's he's overdosed on some uh, uh, some drug that he got from you know some uh, pusher. Uh, or, you know, these guys face the same dilemma in the 20s and 30s. You had to know your bootlegger. You never knew what the, really, what, and, and you don't to this day, you don't know what they put in these concoctions they mix, mix up to sell you. You never knew what these guys put in their booze. You know, today, if you can't afford fine cut expensive cocaine, they'll sell you meth. It's easy and cheap to make. It's easy, it's cheap to buy, pretty cheap to buy. And they can make it in the kitchen or the one of my, uh, some people going up I-35 south of Norman uh, and uh, a car, the trunk of the car catches on fire. They're, they're running a meth lab in the trunk of their car or in the back seat of their car. Uh, you know, and the police pull them over and they go to jail. But the thing is, you don't know what they put in it. And then, of course, this may all be a bunch of old wives tales, but uh, you know, you hear all sorts of things about what they put in meth. Uh, rat poison, uh, Drano, iodine, brake fluid, hydrochloric acid, uh, you know, you never know. And it can kill you. People die from the stuff. Well, in the twenties, they had the same problem. You know, they would put a little, they'd sell you gin, homemade gin, but they'd put a little something in it to give it an extra kick. Uh, they called it, uh, uh, Jamaica ginger. That's what they call gin. That They would make it home and they would sell it to you. Uh, and you might drink that and, you know, get drunk and wake up the next morning and you start to swing out of the bed and you can't because your leg is absolutely paralyzed. And, you know, here's a 20-year-old young man going across the college campus dragging his leg like this for the rest of his life because he had what they called uh, jake leg. They had put some ingredient in there uh, that caused paralysis to a uh, part of his body. Uh, panther whiskey, white lightning, jackass brandy, those things all caused internal bleeding. You, you, might, you might have a wild night and wake up the next morning and go into the bathroom to brush your teeth and cough and blood splatter on the mirror. Because you were drinking, you were consuming a little small amount of brake fluid. Uh, some of this stuff caused blindness, and like I say, some of it caused paralysis. But people continued to drink it, just like despite the danger, just like today, despite the best efforts of parents and teachers and preachers and the police and red ribbon committees on the college campuses. Drinking became cool. Drinking became cool. Uh, what do you, what word do you have for cool today? Every generation comes in and then I ask this question every year and they act like we've never heard that. So what do you use? I've been through them all. When you see something that impresses you, do you have a word for that? Impress me, impress me. Uh, look at this handwriting. Probably that's dope. It's dope. 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 Yeah. dope. Oh, that's lit. What about lit. fire? Oh, yeah, I heard somebody say that the other day on some, you know, some person says, boy, that's fire. Is that the new word? Yeah. Is that right? Dope. What do you think it was? Dope. What do you think it was in the twenties? You might want to see, nobody knows this. Nobody will know this, but you, so you might want to start saying this and start a whole new trend. It would rad. sweep the country. What? Rad. Rad? No, <laughs> not radical. Not groovy, not far out. I lived through all those. I was so glad when Far Out went away. Wait, 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 wait. I'm you waiting. Delighted. <laughs> bully, bully. No, if you were really cool, people would look at you when you walked into the party and they'd say, look at that guy. He's the cat's meow. Cat's meow. <laughs> Trent, you are the cat's meow. You are the cat's meow. <laughs> And by the way, if you really wanted to be the cat's meow, I mean, the guy on campus that everybody admired, you made sure that your fraternity got busted at a party and there was booze there. Yeah, you did. And all of you got your picture on the campus paper and handcuffs of the police putting you in the uh, paddy wagon to take you to jail. Well, those guys are partying. They're the cool. They're the, well, not the cool. They're the, they're the cat's meow. By the way, uh, you know, they would sneak, I mean, you know, they would sneak booze in. One of the ways they snuck booze in, women's skirts, as you're going to see, were much shorter in the 1920s. And they wore stockings and they and they rolled their stockings down. But they could put 
right there in those stockings, a flask. You know what a flask is? A booze flask? It's flat. That's the reason, you know, you put it in your coat pocket. I've got one here. No, you can put one in your coat pocket and nobody knows it's there. So a woman could put that in there and she could go sashaying in. And, you know, the cops might be at the door and they might frisk the guy, but no self-respecting cop is going to ask him lady to raise her skirts and so you know while well, when the dance started and everything was crowded and no one was paying attention you know some of the girls would go over and they'd pull that out and dump that in the punch bowl and then stick their flask back in and, you know that's how you got booze into the uh, party but if your fraternity got busted boy you you were well what am i trying to say you were the uh, cats, cats meow, meow. Yeah. that's the way to do it the big man or the big woman on campus well get this down so with all this going on it soon dawned, listen, it soon dawned on a bunch of local thugs and criminals that they could make a lot of money supplying people with booze. It didn't take long. They didn't have to have a meeting about this. Uh, in fact, get this down. Uh, various criminals in the major cities of the country uh, determined that if they, you know, look, if you can supply all the bars on the north side of Chicago with illegal booze, you're going to be very rich. Okay? So, uh, there are 10,000 speakeasies in Chicago. And if you can supply those, those illegal bars with booze, you and your gang are going to be very rich. So get this out. Throughout the 20s, there's gang wars. Get this down. Throughout the 20s, there are gang wars in every major city in the United States. The gangs shoot it out to try and control the booze trade in these big cities. And they became obscenely wealthy. And these gangs were all ethnic. There were Irish gangs and Jewish gangs and Italian gangs and Sicilian gangs. Chicago was the bloodiest city in America. It is right now. More violent crime in Chicago than any other city, I think, in the country. Get this down. In the 20s, the Chicago bootleg war erupted. The Chicago bootleg war. And in the Chicago bootleg war, get all this down. In the Chicago bootleg war, it came down to three men. An Irishman, gang leader. Oh, here's a there's a speak. You know, look these speakies. And let me say, they'd be off in some alley with the trash, some uh, unsafe part of town, and you would see a limousine pull up, and a guy would get out of a tuxedo and a top hat, and his uh, date or his wife would have an evening gown and jewels on, and they would walk down this dirty alley with stray cats, and they would come down to the stairway and they would go down the stairway and they would come to this battered beaten up door and they would knock say the password and they would get in and then there they are you know it was it was a classy joint some of these places had chandeliers uh look at that that's one speakies you think prohibition is working okay there they are well in chicago three men fought it out for control of the booze trade in the chicago bootleg wars this guy right here write him down d and o'banion they called him dd what was his ethnicity? Irish. He's Irish, okay? He ran an Irish gang. <clears throat> this man, George Bugsy Moran. Bugsy was slang in those days for crazy. That guy's Bugsy. He's crazy. That's what they would say. What uh, ethnicity was he? Moran. Irish. And this guy is the most famous criminal in America. Who is he? Was Sicilian. Al Alphonse Capone. Write him down. Al Capone. Scarface. Started out as a teenager, running messages back and forth for some big boss. And one day he had some money to deliver, and a guy pulled the razor on him and slashed him on the side of the face uh, in a fight to an alley. He was known as Al Capone. There's that. Okay, so Al Capone, get this down. There's Al. Al Capone decided that he wanted to control the whole Chicago booze trade. And he knew that uh, he would have to get rid of his competition. His competition was O'Banion and Moran. So he started with O'Banion. Get this down. He started with O'Banion. Now, O'Banion was an interesting character. Uh, <clears throat> He ran a flower shop. That's what he did. And he had this gang. He was the leader of that gang. He was a ruthless, bloody killer. But he had a gang, and his cover for his illegal activities, when the police would question him, he would say, hey, you got the wrong guy. I run a chain of flower shops. 
And every morning he would show up in his flower shop and he would uh, walk in the front door and snip off a carnation and put it in his buttonhole. And then he would go back and he would work in the, or he would supervise, I guess, people he had working in the flower shop. Well, on the morning of November the 10th, 1924, he was in the back of the store. His favorite flower was the chrysanthemum. Chrysanthemum. I think that's how that's pronounced. And he was arranging, I can't say that. He was arranging chrysanthemums. Chrysanthemums is what the word is. Uh, and he heard a car pull up in front and he turned and he looked uh, and he saw three men get out. All three of those men at one time or another had been part of his gang. He knew every one of them. Yeah, he takes his apron off, dusts off his hands, and he walks to the front of the store, and he's standing there in front of the flower display, and they come in, and they're laughing and joking, and Dee Dee, and he's laughing and joking with them, and he puts his hand out to shake hands with the one in the middle, and the middle guy got his hand, and he started to pull his hand back, and the guy didn't let go of his hand, and he knew he was dead, because that was it. He could have reached in his coat and got his pistol. The guy held on to his hand while the other two guys pumped six slugs into it, okay? And that was the end of D.D., okay? D and the companion. And of course, who had, or who had orchestrated that hit? Mm -hmm. Scarface, dude. Yeah, Ka Capone, yeah, Capone. He had hired some of, pretty neat trick. He had hired some of uh, O'Banion's uh, former gang members uh, to do him in. And of course, O'Banion had a typical gangster funeral in those days. He was buried in a $10,000 lead-lined coffin his coffin was followed by 26 truckloads of flowers that mourners sent. There were 15,000 mourners, and the biggest floral display of them all was a great wreath that was carried in a truck, and it said across it, that had a banner across it, that said, rest in peace, love Al. Okay, Al Capone had him killed and sent flowers to his funeral, and that kicked off the Chicago bootleg war. Next, get this down. Come up, Capone moved to get rid of Moran. So Dee Dee is dead. Now Capone's going to get rid of this guy. And I want you to write down this date, February 14th, 1929, Valentine's Day. The Saint, you've heard of the St. Valentine's Day massacre? Yes. Yes, you have. Well, now you have. Write that down, the St. Valentine's Day massacre. And here's what happened on the north side of Chicago. Valentine's Day massacre. Here's what happened. <clears throat> you know, these, these gang members were always having to outrun the police. So they had to take their cars in and constantly get them tuned up and in top running condition. So uh, Capone found out that uh, Moran and uh, six of his men were going to pick up two cars that they had had at this Northside Chicago mechanic shop. Uh, and so they're getting ready to go. You know, Moran is in his office in downtown Chicago, and they're getting ready to go pick up these cars. He and six of his men, I think it's six of them. And they start out the door, and Moran is with them. He's going, and his phone rings, and he stops to make a phone, and he tells them, go on, I'll catch a cab and meet you at the garage. That saved his life. The other men went down to the mechanic shop. When they got to the mechanic shop, six of them I see here, when they got to the mechanic shop, there was an optometrist, eye doctor there, waiting to pick up his car. Uh, there was a mechanic who worked there, just worked there. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Moran's men arrive, and they're just standing around waiting for their cars, and all of a sudden a police car pulled up at 1030 in the morning, and four men got out. Two of those men were dressed as civilians, and two of them were dressed as Chicago policemen. They all worked for Scarface. Huh? Al could put Scarface out. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the, the, and they go in and they tell all these people, line up. Well, I'm just, I don't care, line up. Well, I, I just work, I don't care, line up. They stand up against the wall. Meanwhile, outside, while that's going on, Moran gets out of his cab, and he starts walking toward the garage. Well, this guy was a lucky duck. He starts working, walking toward the garage, and then all of a sudden he comes around the corner, and he sees that police car. He said, I'm not going in there. And he went across the street and was drinking coffee when the events that I'm about to describe to you happened. They put him up against that wall. Get this down. 
<clears throat> and then Frislam, and by the way, Capone's men are laughing. There. I mean, uh, Moran's men are laughing. They said, you know, well, they'll take us to jail, so what? We'll call Bugsy, and he'll be down and bail us out within the, a half hour. And once they're lined up against that wall and frisk, those men step back and they pull out two sawed-off mm -hmm. shotguns and two Thompson submachine guns with 50-round clips, and they mowed them all down. They ripped them to pieces, shot them all. <clears throat> there they are. St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Here they are. This guy lived. Pete Gusenberg, they rushed him to the hospital. He was called the, uh, the enforcer. And they had a really tough job. They wanted somebody rubbed out. He went and did it. No telling how many people he had assassinated. He was shot 14 times and lived. Uh, and they are, you don't have to write down Gusenberg, but anyway, he shot 14 times and the police are gathered around his bed and they all want to know, Frank, who shot you? Frank, who shot you? And all that Gusenberg, well, his last words were, nobody shot me. Even in death, he refused to rat on the people that killed him. And he died. Of course, what did Bugs Moran do at this point? He left Sorry, Chicago. He, he, you know, he, he packed up and left Chicago. He said, he said, you know, there's a booze trade in this country. There's, you know, I don't have to stay and get my, he got the message and he gets the heck out. And so who does that leave in charge of Chicago? Al Capone. And he's in charge of it. He's in charge of it. He runs, he runs the city. You know, there they are. There's Al. That's his mugshot. There's Al's mugshot. Didn't they get him on like taxes? Or yeah, they did. That's why I'm going to go pay my taxes this afternoon after school. And I'm not too happy. But anyway, he made a hundred. Listen, think about this. Al Capone made a hundred million dollars on prostitution, gambling, and booze. He rode around Chicago in a seven-ton bulletproof car with two carloads of bodyguards behind him and two carloads of bodyguards in front of him. When Al Capone went to the movie, they rented the whole movie theater, and he sat in the middle, surrounded by twenty bodyguards. The Chicago police knew that this guy was behind the crime. And they actually started a special police unit, a special police squad. Which way am I going here? Uh, to get him. They said, all we want you to, we know Capone did that. There's Frank. Where is that? Write this man down, Elliot Ness. We want you to get a group of honest cops and make sure they're honest. Because your only mission, you're not out there to run down speeders or arrest jaywalkers. You've got to get Capone. And for years they tried to get Capone. And they never did. By the way, this group of special policemen, they were called the untouchables. Why were they called the untouchables? Why were they called the untouchables? Because. Huh? What? No, no. They couldn't be bribed. That's it. Right? You know, well, hey, one of the ways that Capone got away with this is he made all this money. He just bribed judges, bribed state legislatures. He might have bribed the mayor. Yes. But these guys couldn't be bribed. And, of course, they tried to get Capone. There have been movies made about this called him. They tried to get Capone, and they never did. Finally, as you point out, a clerk, an IRS agent, discovered that he had not paid his taxes. I'm not here tomorrow. Well, they discovered I haven't paid my taxes for the last 10 years. And he was sent to prison. And he was sent to a new security prison right there. It's a museum today, but it's out in San Francisco Bay. What is that called? Um, Alcatraz. Yeah, Alcatraz. Yeah, I don't know what that means, the word Alcatraz. But it's an island. It's out, you know, and today I've been to San Francisco, but I didn't go out to the tour. My brother and his wife live there, there, and they've been out, and they say, eh, save your money. But I thought, well, I might go out, but I didn't. Anyway... They say no one ever escaped from Alcatraz. They said even if you could get out, uh, the water in uh, San Francisco Bay is so cold that you would be dead at hot thermia by the time you reach the shore. Or And there are sharks out there. I mean, this is the ocean. There are sharks out there. And so they say no one ever escaped. They say, I, my brother and his wife said, when you go there, they, you know, they all make a special trip and they show you Al Capone's cell. 
But he got out in 1939. He still had his money, and he goes down to Florida. And there he is on his yacht in Florida fishing with a cigar. With a cigar. He died in 19... He served seven years, by the way. He served seven years for income to all the things that he beat people to death with baseball bats. He, he had them hold people down and slice the bottom of their feet. He did it with, slice, with straight racers. Okay, he did horrible, horrible things. Adler Grant, come to the office, please. And for all of that, he got seven years. He died in 1947. He was only 48 years old. He died of a combination of heart disease, syphilis, and of course the thing that finally finished him off, he was lying in his bed and had a stroke. Well, by 1933, get this down, the government realized that the noble experiment, and, and write that phrase down, that's, you know, after Prohibition failed, somebody asked Herbert Hoover, who was running for president, and he favored Prohibition. They said, you know, Prohibition's failed. What do you think of this effort? And he said, well, it might have failed, but it was a noble experiment. And it was meaning it was something that the government did with the best intentions, even though, even though it failed. Uh, and so, you know, Will Rogers said this about it. They said, Will, what do you think about prohibition? He said, well, you know, thought for me, he said, prohibition is better than no booze at all, okay? I mean, it was a, end quote, it was, it was an absolute failure. And when we come back tomorrow, I'll write this down, we'll talk about the legacy of prohibition. What difference did prohibition make? It made more of a difference than you think.